guys. All right, so, you know, I remember the first time I fell off of a horse. Has anybody here fallen off of a horse? Yes. Thank you, my people. I feel at home now. So the first time I fell off of a horse, I was about five years old, and um, I was visiting my cousin in Mexico. She had her own horse, and literally her horse decided to stand on its hind legs, and I held on for dear life to her, and she was about half my weight, and we both went down. Now, till this day, she claims she's never fallen off of a horse. She was pulled off of a horse, but I'm sticking to my story. We both fell off that horse, and it, it was real. Now, the next time I fell off of a horse, I was 12 years old. So you would think that I should not be getting on horses if I was going to be falling off horses, but you know what? I, I think that you, you can't give up on stuff that easily. So I was 12 years old. I, I was on this horse. We're at a rodeo. The horse decides to to take off and race horses that were just strolling along. I mean, I wasn't expecting for it to take off. I was expecting to simply make it trot a little. Like, I've never claimed to be. I never told the horse that I was a professional, like, horse rider, that I would not fall. But somehow, this horse decided she was going to take off. And take off she did, and off I went. I literally flew off the horse. I landed on my back. We are in Mexico, four hours away from any hospital or doctor, so all we had was Jesus. And we just prayed that everything would be fine, and I could walk, and that was it. That was all we could do about it. And that was when I was 12 years old. Now, the third time I fell off of a horse, I was about 16 years old. And my cousin told me, you really shouldn't ride this horse. We really haven't been... Uh, mounting him for a couple of weeks now. He, he's a little wild. And I said, listen, I'm not trying to run the horse. I just want to go for a nice ride. Like, I'm 16 years old. I can handle this. And I figured, like, I could almost, this was not a big horse. Like, my feet could almost touch the ground, right? Like, I'm a tall girl. I'm good. I got this. I get on that horse, and um, I decided to bring my cousin with me. And I said, another cousin, because... The last victim wouldn't get on a horse with me again. So I got, I got another girl. She got on the horse with me. And I said, listen, I'll go in the back. You could go in the front. We're going to be good. And um, no, it was opposite. I went in the front. She went in the back. I said, just hold on to me. I'm bigger than you. But sure enough, this horse, about five minutes into our ride, decides to buck. Now, I'm telling you, I wish that back when I was 16 years old, there were smartphones that could have captured my, like, award-winning, holding on to a bucking horse moment. But nobody captured this incredible, incredible, like, just amazing moment in my life. The horse literally knocked her off immediately. Like, she was gone. She's off the horse. I, on the other hand, hello. That thing threw me to the back part of the seat, and I held on to the chair. So while that thing was bucking, I was holding on to the chair of the horse for dear life for a good glorious, I would say three to five seconds. Um, if I get really excited, I could say maybe eight seconds, but that probably wouldn't be true because it knocked me over and it threw me off. So when I was about 19 years old, I went to another rodeo with my brother and his friend had a horse. So I came up to his friend and I said, hey, can I borrow your horse? And, and he's looking at me like, is she for real? I said, yeah, man, let me just borrow your horse for a little while. Like, I'm not going to use it the entire time we're at the rodeo. Just give me like 15, 20 minutes. I'll give them back to you. And this guy turns over to my brother and he says, bro, doesn't your sister like fall off horses? <laughs> it's so rude, first of all. And I said, like, come on. And my brother said, no, man, she does not fall off horses. That's just how she gets off the horse. You're good. Let her borrow the horse. And literally, he let me borrow the horse. But, you know, what's interesting about this is in life, what are we going to be known for? Like, what will people remember us for? What will different seasons of our lives represent when people say your name? When they say Brittany or Stephanie or Mark or John or uh, Rex, whatever your name is, when they say your name, what are people going to think? What is the conclusion that has been made based on maybe a moment or a season. Because what I want to talk to you guys today is that 
That is not how it works with God. How many of you are grateful that God doesn't just look at one moment in our lives and put us in a category, amen? Like our God is not just a God who's getting ready to put us in a section and, and leave us there, right? And so I know you guys have been looking at the story of Peter, right? And, and Peter is a, an amazing person in the scriptures because we get to learn from somebody who is very human and who we could relate to because of his, you know, passion but also his imperfection. So... We're going to read in the scriptures together. You can follow me on the screen. In the book of John, chapter 21, it says, this is Simon Peter talking to the disciples. He decides he's going to go back to what? To fishing. To what he knows how to do, right? What he was doing professionally when Jesus called him, Peter was a fisherman. You guys already know this because you guys have been looking at Peter's life. So Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught what? Nothing. They caught nothing. Can you guys just imagine this for a moment? Peter is a professional fisherman. This is what he does for a living. This is what he knows to do. And he finds himself with his crew, and he is able to catch absolutely nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? Did they have any food, guys? Was there any food? Was there any fish? Right? These guys have been slaving away all night trying to catch some fish. And Jesus is like, hey, how's that fishing coming along? How's that fish? Do you have any? No. Then he said to them, he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Now, I want us to just stop there for a moment because we get to see that Peter goes to do what he feels he's good at doing and yet what he's working so hard to acquire, listen closely, what he's wanting so much to have. I don't know what it is you are going through in this season of life, what it is you desire, what you're trying to, to have when it comes to relationship with friends or with your family or maybe with a, with a boy or, or a girl that you're interested in. And, and maybe there's a goal for you and maybe you desire something for your school or your sport or whatever it is that you do competitively. And, and you're desiring something because it's going to bring a sense of satisfaction. It's going to bring a sense of fulfillment. Now, What's interesting is that Peter goes to do what he thinks he's really good at, and he gets absolutely nothing. And yet, at the command of the voice of Jesus, everything that Peter was looking for comes into his lane. It comes into his life. Now, look how amazing Jesus is. It says, then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. How powerful is this, guys? How powerful is it that what Peter is working so hard to get, Jesus has in his hands already? How powerful is it that what he is trying so much to acquire is in the hands of a God that is creative and able to do so much more if we allow him to do so? I mean, they've been slaving away all night, and Jesus is at the shore with the filet fish He's got the fish grill, and he's got some bread, and he's like, what's up, guys? You're working really hard to satisfy something in you that I already have to give to you. And so Peter comes and, and they realize it's Jesus. And Jesus begins this conversation with Peter that I would like to suggest this evening is a, is a conversation that is a continuation of a past one that he had with, Pe with Peter before. So let, let's, let's read what it says. So when they had eaten breakfast, right, they had fish for breakfast. I don't have to understand this. But I'm just going to read it and be like, okay, if you want to have fish for breakfast, go for it. I like pancakes, thank you. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. 
He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, do you guys remember that Jesus had this conversation with his disciples where he had asked them, okay, guys, who do people say that I am? Do you remember that conversation? And some said, oh, you're like a prophet or you are this person or you are that person. And then Peter was the only one who had the right answer. You guys remember that? Peter actually comes into this conversation and he has this incredible moment, this powerful, just amazing, beautiful revelation moment, this moment where his life, his body, his mouth proclaims something so powerful that it would change the world and generations to come. Now, I, I would like to suggest that this moment is what I call, I, I don't know how to say this. I, I don't know if you're going to, I don't know if there's anybody in this audience who's going to understand what I'm trying to say, but, but I'm going to give it a shot anyways. Listen closely. I really feel and I believe that in that moment, Peter was having what I would like to call a, a Kame. Hame ha moment. Do you know, does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say Kamehameha? Come on, people. Where are my Dragon Ball Z people here in the house? Come on. It, it's that moment where your being exudes something so powerful that it literally is able to destroy everything in its sight, right? Peter had that moment with Jesus. And Peter was in that place and that space with Jesus when everybody else was saying, oh, you're a prophet or you're like kind of like John the Baptist or you are this or you are that, you are Elijah. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Like he makes this powerful declaration. So what happens from that point on? So Jesus goes on to have this conversation with Peter because Peter was getting ready to deny Jesus, right? Peter's getting ready to find himself in a situation where he says, I don't even know who you are, and, and Jesus knew this. So I want us to look at Luke chapter 22, verse 32. It says, Jesus saying this to Peter, I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Now, Jesus is telling Peter, I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail you. I mean, listen, guys, when Jesus prays, because he is God, he's praying basically like to himself because he is God. So he's going to answer his prayer. I mean, I'm thinking, right? At least he really should because he's able to do that. But I want you to pay close attention to what Jesus prays for. Because he prays, Peter, I pray that your faith doesn't fail you. Notice that Jesus does not tell Peter, I am praying that you don't fail me. He says, I am praying that your faith in me does not fail you. That your understanding, Peter, this is what Jesus was basically telling Peter. Peter, my prayer is because I'm not the kind of God that's going to manipulate or control or treat you like a puppet. So you will be making some bad choices, Peter. How many of us here can say we've made some bad choices, right? We've made some bad choices. But here's Jesus' prayer for us as well, is that our faith in him would not fail us. What does that mean? It means that your understanding, my friend, of who Jesus is, that your understanding, basically Jesus was telling Peter, Peter, I pray that you would know who I am to such a degree. I pray that your faith in who I am, that I am a God that forgives, that I am a God that is able to do the impossible, that I am a God that, that will bring the dead back to life, that I heal broken hearts. Peter, I pray that your faith in my character doesn't fail you when you find yourself in a bad place. 
that you remember who I truly am and not who the enemy says that I am. Because you know, when we make bad choices, we find ourselves beating ourselves up and allowing the enemy's lies to beat us up so that we stay away from God. But Jesus' desire is that our faith in him would not fail. That our faith in his character and who God is would draw us once again back into relationship with him. And so Jesus tells Peter, I've got an assignment for you. You're going to make some bad choices, but I pray that your faith doesn't fail you. And because I'm praying that, it's going to happen because I'm going to answer my own prayer. And when that happens, Peter, and you have repented, I need you to come back and strengthen your brothers. So literally this conversation now that Jesus is having with Peter, and he's saying, do you love me? And he says, take care of my lambs and feed my lambs and take care of my sheep. You know what it is, guys? It's basically Jesus saying, Peter, our job together, our journey is not over. I let you know before that there was going to be an assignment for you to do. I'm here to talk to you about that assignment again. What happens too many times is that, friends, we disqualify ourselves. We think that because we made a bad choice or we found ourselves in a bad situation that God has given up on the assignment that he's given us. And Jesus was there to remind Peter, Peter, remember I told you that when you were to repent, you were to come back and strengthen your brothers. Now I'm asking you again, Peter, do you love me? Because if you love me, you need to care for the people who are going to start to follow me. Peter, I need you to do this. I've got work for you to do. I've got an assignment for you. But oftentimes we disqualify ourselves maybe because of where we grew up or where we come from. Maybe because of the situation in our family or in our home. I know what that's like. I mean, I grew up in a home where my mom loved Jesus but my father didn't. And I grew up in a home where I had to deal with a lot of issues within my siblings with drugs and alcohol and a lot of things happening in my family. A lot of brokenness and a lot of pain. A lot of reasons for me to have believed, you know what, God, I, it'll be... It'll be decent if I'm simply a Christian and I simply claim to love you. That should be more than enough for my life because I'm already doing better. But God doesn't qualify us or disqualify us based on our background or who we are or where we've been. It is his calling and his assignment over each and every one of our lives. So when I was about 12 years old, I had my radical encounter with Christ and it changed my life forever. I experienced the presence of God in a way that I knew I would never, ever be the same. And when I was in high school in ninth grade, I was in love with God and I thought, God, how can I share this message with people in my school? So you know what I did is I sat in my, in my, in my geography class and my teacher, he literally talked about creationism for like 90, 95% of the class. And then the rest of the time he talked about evolution and I was like, oh my gosh, you are so Christian. So I was like, I need to talk to this guy. Ninth grade year, I go up to Mr. Gerhardt, and I say, Mr. Gerhardt, I think you're a Christian, aren't you? And he's like, how'd you know? I'm like, dude, dead giveaway. You talked about creation for like 95% of the period and then about evolution for five seconds, you know? Like, I could tell you're Christian. He was like, oh, okay. So then I said to him, you know, I, I was thinking, what if we like did a Bible club in our school? What if... We found a way to share the message of Jesus with students. And he said, come back during lunchtime. I want you to meet someone. And I said, okay. So literally, here's this girl. I am nervous out of my wits because I'm like, I'm taking a stand. I'm about to go even more public with my faith. The accountability for my life is going to be at another level. I am not the girl for this job. I don't come from a very stable background. Um, I don't know. Maybe I made a mistake. And so I go to Mr. Gerhardt's class right before lunch, and we walk over to this other classroom. And there was these ladies, these teachers, two teachers sitting in that classroom, two females and a male. And Mr. Gerhardt basically said, this is Noemi. She's interested in starting a Bible club in our school. And they said, we have been praying for you for over a year. We've been asking God that he would bring someone because it cannot be led by teachers. It needs to be led by students. And so we need you to know that we've been praying that you would come. We didn't know who you were, but we knew that God was at work in somebody. And here you are. And I'm just standing there like, you've been praying for me? <laughs> like, oh man, like I just felt like, are you serious? You know what it was, guys. Here's what it is. Is that God begins to align our lives 
to live a life that is much greater and an adventure that is far more powerful than we could ever write out for our own lives if we stop disqualifying ourselves based on our background or our own experiences. And that's what Peter was doing. You know what Peter said? You know what? I denied Jesus. I messed up. I'm just going to go back to doing what I'm really good at, and I'm going to forget about the last three years of my life. And Jesus was like, we're not done, Peter. We've got work to do. There are people who are waiting on the other side of your obedience. There are lives that are going to be healed. And I'll tell you, friends, the first time that our Bible club opened up, 60 students showed up. And they were not even Christian kids. They were just kids on campus who I kept on coming up to and saying, hey, why don't you come? Hey, why don't you come? Years later on Facebook, I still get messages of friends who say, hey, you know what? I just recently came to faith, but I'll never forget that the seed was planted when I was in high school. I remember you talking to me about Jesus. I remember you talking to me about a God that loved me. And when I found myself in a really bad place, God came and rescued me. Why, guys? Because we are not to look at our young age or at any season of our lives as an incapable or unworthy or unable season to do something great for the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what God is calling us to do just like he did with Peter. You know, oftentimes what we do is we say, God, you know what, I, I, I've, I've made too many bad choices. God, you know the battles that go on in my heart. And in my mind, you know the things that I struggle with, God. I'm not the girl for the job. I'm not the guy for the job. But that's not what God is saying to us today, guys. That is not what he's speaking into our lives today. And to illustrate just this idea, just this powerful idea of what God is able to do, I, I want us to go together to the story in the book of Jeremiah. And this story in Jeremiah is powerful because it really... It really speaks into a very personal space in our lives, just like Jesus did with Peter. You know, when Jesus talked to Peter, he said to him, do you love me? And he's got, yes, Lord, I love you. You know, I love that Jesus didn't tell Peter, hey, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Then why did you deny me, Peter? Like, how amazing is it that God does not bring up old stuff, right? Can you guys be excited about that with me tonight? Like, thank you, God, that you don't bring up the old stuff. That you're not looking for opportunities to smash us and put us down, right? He doesn't say, hey, Peter, if you love me, then why did you tell that person when you were by the fire pit that you didn't even know who I was? Like, Jesus is not bringing up old stuff. Jesus is not stuck in your past. Jesus is not stuck in the would-haves, should-haves, and could-haves of your life. Listen closely. Jesus is not stuck in the would-haves, could-haves, or should-haves of your life. He is not in some hypothetical decision that you should have made in the past. Jesus is in your present. Jesus is not in the mistakes of our history he is in the reality of our present right now. There's never a moment when you are most close to God than when you are real with yourself. Because God is in tune with the reality of your life. God is in tune with the reality of what you are facing right now. And the more real you can be with yourself, the more real God could be in your life. So this story in Jeremiah is a powerful story. And you're going to say, what does this have to do with Peter, you're going to see in just a moment. Jeremiah chapter 18. It says, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go to the potter's house. And there I will cause you to hear my words. Now, when I read this, I think, if I was Jeremiah and I could hear God telling me to go to somebody's house. Listen, guys, it is hot in the Middle East. I would have told God. I can hear you loud and clear right here, God. Like, I don't have to go to Potter's house. You want to tell me something? I'm all ears. Talk to me right here. But God was trying to give Jeremiah an illustration. He says, I'm going to show you something. Go to the Potter's house. I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the Potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Where was it marred? 
Where was it marred? In the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. And he made it into another vessel. I want you to listen to those words just for a moment. If you could just close your eyes for a second where you are. Just close your eyes. I want you to picture this. I want you to picture this, this vessel, this piece of clay that the potter was working on. It becomes marred. It falls apart in the hands of the potter. And the scripture says that he made it into another. He made it into another. He made it into another. He didn't take it and throw it away. It was still the same piece of clay, but it was another. It was still the same piece of clay that fell apart, but it was another. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a situation in life where you have encountered the beauty of God's love and you're saying, God, it's still me, but it's not me anymore. God, it's still me. I'm still broken. I'm still human. But God, it's not me anymore because I have come in contact with something that is so beautiful, God. He took it and made it into another. And God will do the same with us if we would allow ourselves to be undone in the hands of the potter. He has a purpose and a destiny and a calling for each and every one of us that is unique. And you yourself will be a witness to the fact that you'll find yourself in moments saying, it's me, but it's not me anymore. When I stood in front of those teachers, I said, God, I'm here, but I'm, it, I can't believe that I'm going to be the girl for the job. It's me, God, but it's not me anymore. It is now your spirit in me. It is now your faithful love in me. It is now your power in me. It is now your hand working in me and through me. Thank you, God, that you're not looking for opportunities to discard what people would think is useless. Thank you, God. Thank you that you love me so much that you would take me and turn me into another. Thank you that you would take the broken pieces of my heart and begin to make an art and piece of beautiful art that would tell a story of redemption and restoration. Thank you, God, that you're not done with us yet. Is that you tonight? Is that you? Are you in the place where you have said, I would never be able to carry the gospel in that way. And God is saying, you're the girl for the job. You're the boy for the job. You're the guy. You're the fella. You're the lady. You're the one who is to carry this message. You know, when I was a little girl, I was about eight years old, my mom used to have this porcelain doll in her, in her, in her living room. It's the cutest porcelain doll. I mean, I had Barbie dolls, but there was something that intrigued me about this doll, and I think it was the fact that it held a bird in its hand, and, and the hand never moved. Like, why would you make a doll where the hand never moves, I thought to myself. So I was interested in the fact that this little arm was always with the little bird perched to the little porcelain doll's mouth. I remember I got that doll, and I was trying to see if maybe the arm would move just a little bit. I broke the arm off the doll. And I decided to go to my mom's room and go through her box of gum. I chewed a piece of gum and I stuck that arm back together. It was beautiful, guys. Nobody would have known it. Except that the hot and steamy days of summer arrived. And when that happened, my mom found the doll's arm at its feet with a large piece of gum stringing across because it had melted. My mom loved that doll, and she didn't see this as an opportunity to necessarily chastise me, but more so to teach me a lesson. You don't fix a doll's arm with chewing gum. You get some good old crazy glue or that awesome gorilla glue, which gets all over the place, and then it's a mess, but it works wonders. She put the arm back together, and for many years, that doll stood there as a reminder that because it was broken, she didn't get rid of it. 
There's an assignment for each and every one of us, friends. I'm going to pray a blessing over you tonight. That as you are drawing near the end of this time together, that you would lean in to hear what God is asking of your life, in your space, in your city, in your community, in your world. And saying, God, because you don't disqualify me, what you have for me is what I want. What your plan says, it's better than mine. So I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to believe with you for that direction and that guidance over your life. Because Jesus is saying, do you love me? Because if you do, we've got work to do, friends. There are too many people in this world who need to hear about this Jesus who heals, restores, and empowers those who are brokenhearted. God, I thank you for every young person within the sound of my voice tonight. I thank you that you are with us and that you are for us. I thank you that our lives and our pasts do not disqualify us, but you, oh God, are willing and able to move us into the future as healed, transformed, encouraged, and strengthened sons and daughters of a living God, a mighty king, a faithful father. Lord, I just pray right now, God, that your presence would rest upon us in such a way that it would draw out, Lord, a passion to chase after your heart. That we, Father God, would say, Lord, here I am, send me. Here I am, God, with everything that I've done, with everything that I've lived, with everything that I've said. Here I am, God. You did it with the clay. You took it and you turned it into another. Would you do that with our lives? In Jesus' name, amen.